we're ready to start and we can go to the next slide. So we're here to talk about the city's commercial electric vehicle charging ordinance, what it is, why we have it, how to comply, and hopefully why it's a win-win for everyone here. My name is Suzanne Lucen. I'm a Clean Cities Coalition Coordinator at the San Francisco Department of the Environment, and I'm here with my colleague, Jenny Kahn, and we will present, um, we will be your, your presenters today. Next slide, please. So before we begin, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Participants are automatically muted on entry to this meeting to prevent background noise. For the Q&A portions of the event, please use the chat function to ask your questions. The chat can be opened by clicking on the speech bubble icon on the menu bar. We encourage and appreciate your engagement in the chat. If you experience technical difficulties or connectivity issues, please note that we'll send a follow-up email in about a week, and the information presented today will be on the sfenvironment.org website. To keep things simple, we will be presenting today with cameras off, and we would also like it if you'd please add your name and organization when asking a question in the chat. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So a quick review of the agenda. Again, welcome and thank you for being here. We'll begin with a review of the ordinance and some overall context on how we got here today. Then Jenny will cover the requirements of the ordinance and review the compliance process, and that will be followed by a question and answer period. After that, we'll have a panel with EV service providers from ENLX and the EV Connect and Catalyze team. Each represents a different business model for installing and managing EV charging, and there will be plenty of time for questions. Then we'll have some concluding remarks before we wrap up. Next slide, please. So before we get before we begin, we have a poll question for you. The poll should appear in two locations, both in the chat window and also as a pop-up. Respond in whichever form is more convenient, and don't worry if one or the other does not appear for you. Live results will appear in the chat, but not in the pop-up window. We'll give you about 30 seconds to respond, and then we'll read out the results. Okay, so I'm looking at the chat results. <laughs> it looks like we have uh, only three responses, um, an EV service providers and two that um, responded as other. So I think we will go on to the next slide. Great, so a quick review Sorry, a quick review of ordinance number 244-19. It was passed by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in October 2019. It applies to commercial garages and parking lots that are open to the public, charge a fee for parking, and have more than 100 spaces. Those facilities must install level two charging in 10% of those parking spaces by January 2023. The ordinance includes a formula to substitute DC fast chargers for level two chargers, which will be discussed in the compliance section. The ordinance requires a good faith effort to analyze the financial and technical feasibility for EV charging at each affected facility and includes a waiver process for facilities where installing EV charging is not feasible at this time. Next slide. So a few months after the ordinance was passed, we held a well-attended in-person workshop at the Metro Center in San Francisco. 
The, that workshop was followed by an expo that gave attendees an opportunity to speak with a number of EV service providers about their offerings. We had hoped to repeat those live workshops, but that was not to be, as we all know. Instead, we've offered a series of online workshops such as this, and since we can't host an expo, we will be sending out a packet of information about EV service providers as a follow-up to this workshop. Next slide, please. Increasing EV, sorry, increasing public EV charging supports the city's climate goals. We had been working toward a goal of net zero emissions by 2050, but in July 2021, during the adoption of our new climate action plan, Mayor Breed moved that goal to 2040. So, because transportation accounts for about 50% of greenhouse gas emissions, we have more to do in less time. Next slide, please. Our call to action is San Francisco's 080-100 Roots Climate Action Framework. That's zero for zero waste, 80% low carbon trips, walking, biking, public transit, 100% renewable energy, and routes for carbon sequestration. So again, the 80% low carbon trip goal means shifting trips from personal vehicles to walking, biking, and public transit. But for trips requiring personal vehicles, we want those vehicles to we want electric vehicles to be the easy, accessible, and affordable choice. Next slide, please. To support the city's climate action goals, our 2019 EV roadmap established a goal of 100 percent emission free trips in, out, and through San Francisco by 2040, with interim goals in 2025 and 2030 shown here. Meeting these goals means that we'll have about 170,000 electric cars in San Francisco in 2030, or about 40% of total registration. And as you know, California's 2020 executive order requires electric vehicles to be 100% of new car registrations across the state by 2035. Next slide, please. Currently, electric cars are about 11% of new car sales in California. Preliminary estimates for national sales indicate that electric cars are about 15% of all car sales and the demand is a huge increase over previous years. There are over 100, there are over 70 models available now with more coming in 2022, including electric pickups and vans. Bloomberg New Energy Finance projects that in 2024, the purchase price of an electric car will be equal to that of a similar internal combustion engine vehicle. And we know that electric cars cost about one third to maintain and operate compared to gas vehicles. And generally electric car drivers pay about a dollar to a dollar 20 for gas gallon equivalent for fuel. Next slide, please. So what does this mean in terms of expanding EV charging? To understand that we estimated the demand for publicly accessible EV charging in 2030. The analysis was conducted by the International Council on Clean Transportation, or ICCT, which is an independent nonprofit organization known for high quality research and for discovering the Volkswagen diesel scandal. ICCT quantified the number, type, and distribution of charging stations needed to support rapid EV uptake, which is shown on this map. The zip codes shown in darker green will have higher electric vehicle stocks and vice versa. The demand for public level two and fast chargers are shown respectively by the orange and blue numbers, which are shown in circles, whose size indicates the relative demand for public chargers in each zip code. The take home message is that even with a major reduction in personal automobile trips, we need EV charging in the city to expand by about 18% per year to keep up with demand. Currently, we have about 1,000 publicly accessible chargers in San Francisco, and we need about five, we need more than 5,000 in 2030. Next slide, please. With San Francisco's real estate constraints, limited supply, high costs, one way to meet that char charging demand is to electrify as many existing parking places as possible. The city is working to expand charging infrastructure in our publicly owned garages and lots, and the Port of San Francisco is expanding public charging in its properties. The commercial garage ordinance requires larger parking operators to make a good faith effort to evaluate the potential for EV charging in their facilities 
and install charging where feasible. With San Francisco's real estate, oh, never mind. Sorry about that. Now I'm going to hand it over to Jenny to talk about ordinance requires and compliance steps. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, the commercial garage ordinance requires public commercial garages and lots with more than 100 parking spaces to install EV charging stations at 10% of spaces by January 1st, 2023. There are two ways to comply. The first is to install level two charging stations defined as stations with less than 40 kilowatts at 10% parking spaces. The maximum required number of level two chargers is 200. For example, if your garage has 2,500 spaces, you'd be required to install 200 level two chargers instead of 250. The second way to comply is to install direct current, also known as DC fast charging stations that provide a similar volume of charging. DC fast chargers are more powerful, so less chargers are needed to supply a similar volume of charging. A minimum of two DC fast chargers are required with an additional charger required for every additional 250 spaces over 750. For example, a garage with 1,500 spaces would be required to install five DC fast chargers. The maximum number of DC fast chargers would be required for would be required is eight for any project. Next slide. In the event that your site cannot comply with the ordinance, there is a waiver process. Operators can request a full or partial waiver based on a variety of factors. We take into account insufficient existing electrical capacity, site conditions which technically prevent installation, and require documentation of good faith efforts with at least two service providers to qualify for a waiver. Next slide. The, this ordinance is connected to the permitting process and at the beginning of this year on January 1st, 2022 ordinance compliance or waiver completions are conditions of the commercial parking facility permit issued by the SFPD. Lack of good faith effort and compliance will result in fines or suspensions or revocation of your permit. We don't want you to be impacted by any of these enforcement mechanisms and we're here to support you through the process. Next. Since the ordinance will impact the permit renewal process, I want to provide a brief overview of it. Six to eight weeks before your permit expires, you should contact SFPD to begin the process. SFPD will send you a permit packet, which will include the permit application, checklist, site security plan form, and the ordinance fact sheet. Next, you'll need to complete ordinance requirements, which will be either the compliance form, form A, or the waiver form, form B. After completing the rest, um, the permit application, you can schedule a meeting with SFPD to submit your application. A completed ordinance form is a required part of your, pre your permit renewal packet as of January 1st, 2022. We don't want your permit process to be delayed, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Next. The main goal of this workshop is to provide you with all the information you need to get started with the ordinance process. The process starts by contacting an electric vehicle service provider, also known as an EVSP, to arrange a consultation and feasibility study. Whether you think your site can or cannot comply, contacting an EVSP is an important first step to begin the process. Next, you can work with one or more EVSPs to find out which financing, installation, maintenance, and ownership models are available to determine which works best for your site. Once you determine your plan, you need to complete the appropriate form, Form A, the compliance form, or Form B, the waiver form. Finally, you need to submit your permit application, your selected ordinance form, and backup documents to SFPD. Next. Before I present on more details about the form, we want to gain a better understanding of your site status. So please fill out the poll that displays on your screen and answer the question, what stage of the process is your site in? We'll give everyone about 30 seconds and hopefully the poll works. We have about 15 seconds left. Okay. 
All right, and it looks like um, maybe the poll is still not working. Um, it shows 25% uh, or two people have not contact or still need to contact an EVSP and six people are not associated with the garage. All right, let's um, move on to the next slide. In this next section, I will provide more details on the compliance and waiver forms and the information that will be required for completion. Note that for all forms, you'll be required to provide information on the garage address and the applicant contact information so we can follow up with the right person if we need information to approve the forms. Let's get started with Form A, the compliance form. In it, we'll require information on the charging station provider, date the stations will be open to the public, and the equipment schedule and site plan for the stations. We'll also need the total number of parking spaces, type and number of charging stations, the power output and number of connectors per station. Next. Form B is the full or partial waiver request form. You'll need to select one or more justification that applies to your site. There are three available waiver reasons and they each have a specific duration. Utility infrastructure is unable to supply sufficient electrical capacity will result in a five year waiver. Site conditions make it technically infeasible to install the infrastructure will also result in a five year waiver. Site conditions make compliance financially infeasible will result in a two year waiver. Now we'll go through each of these reasons in more detail. Next. Let's start with the first reason. The existing local utility infrastructure is unable to supply sufficient electrical capacity. For example, some sites may not have the infrastructure available to upgrade their site with charging. This reason is eligible for a full or partial waiver request. If the reason is selected, it will require information on existing and required service amperage, estimated cost for upgrade, license contractor name and license number, and the supporting report or analysis. One key thing that is required for all waivers is supporting documentation outlining the fi site findings from a professional. Next. Second reason, site conditions make it technically infeasible to install the infrastructure. For example, a site may not meet the ADA requirements for the charging installation. This reason is eligible for a full or partial waiver request. If this reason is selected, we'll require information on the existing site condition, name of the company that conducted site analysis, company contact information, and the supporting report or analysis. Next. Finally, the third reason, garage operator has made good faith efforts to enter into an agreement with at least two EVSPs at minimal or no cost to operator, but the companies declined because the agreement was not financially viable. For some sites, the math may not pencil out, so this waiver option is available. One key requirement is that sites must work with at least two EVSPs to get their site assessed. This reason is eligible for a full waiver request only. If this reason is selected, we'll require information from both EVSP companies that provided the assessments and the associate report support reporting um, su supporting report or analysis. Next. Sites are eligible to apply for a partial waiver if they can install some chargers but are unable to meet full compliance due to insufficient electrical capacity or technical technically infeasibility. To apply for a partial waiver, you must include information on the number of level two or fast charging stations to meet full requirement, the number of level two or fast charging stations proposed for partial waiver. You'll also need to provide the approximate date the stations will be available to the public, the report or analysis to support the request, and the equipment schedule and site plan for the stations you plan to have installed. And that completes the overview of the forms. Next. For next steps, you can always go to sfenvironment.org to check out the latest information on the ordinance. The webpage features the ordinance text, fact sheets, as well as the forms once they become available online. Some key dates to keep in mind, as of January 1st, 2022, ordinance forms are required for annual permit renewal. You can always contact us as soon as you have any questions so your permit process won't be delayed. The ordinance forms will be available online by, Jan by March 2022. However, if your site is ready to complete the forms before then, please contact us directly at chargingmadeeasy at sfgov.org and we can provide you with a PDF to fill out. We'll also notify all workshop attendees once the forms are available online. 
Finally, the ordinance compliance date is January 1st, 2023. That may seem like a long time from now, but it's crucial that you start work now so you're not at risk at incurring any fines. Next. Now let's open up for any questions on compliance. We have about eight minutes available to take your questions. Please use the chat box to enter your questions. Keep in mind that we'll be covering EV service provider resources next, and we'll have another opportunity for questions later in the workshop. I see there was a question from Michael. Um, they asked, do garage owners have to contact with only EV SP providers that SFE pre-approves or can owners work with any EVSP? And Suzanne did cover that. Um, you're free to work with any EV service providers of your choice. And we will be sending an EVSP service um, provider resource packet um, when we send um, after this presentation so you so you'll have a packet with several EVSPs that do work in the Bay Area. And there's a question from Lily. Um, I'm interested in understanding deadlines and whether EV charging stations are required in our building even though we have less than 100 striped parking spots. Also would be great to know if there are city funded programs to help pay for a portion of the cost as well. Um, I can take we, that. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is Suzanne. So um, the requirement is for garages with more than one with 100 or more parking spaces as reported to the San Francisco Police Department in your permit to operate. So that's the criteria. And if you, um, Lily, if you need more um, fine grain information on that, we're happy to follow up with you um, after um, after the webinar. Um, there are no city funded programs um, to to bring down the cost, but I will be covering um, a, a regional um, incentive program in the next section. And then the next question, if the garage doesn't have sufficient power to provide EV charging and has to install additional equipment, does that qualify for a full waiver? That's really on a case by case basis. We um, there is the possibility of having a partial waiver um, to account for your site limitations, and we can certainly um, talk about your specific case um, offline. Right. Can you verify that the compliance is if you have a garage that has less than 100 marked spaces but uses stacked valet parking to increase capacity for more vehicles? My understanding at this point is that we're looking at um, marked spaces, not valet spaces and not stacked spaces. Um, that just, yeah, that, that, that's the interpretation at the moment and we think that that will stand. Okay, um, I'm not sure I can answer this completely, but we have two buildings within one entity that share a garage. We have fewer than 750 spaces. Since there are two building addresses under one entity, does that still fall under two rapid chargers per 750 spaces, or will my property need four charging stations? Also, we have charging stations that are tenant owned. Does that count as compliance? I think this is the kind of question that we would need to look at um, more specifically. Um, it's very specific around the building addresses and we would need to consult the licensing agency. 
um, the police department to make sure that we are following their rules and being consistent. So um, we are happy to um, follow up with you afterward to help interpret that and are happy to do that at the earliest convenience so that um, so that you're able to um, work through compliance. Next question, has this process been completed by anyone and is there are there examples of waiver submissions that we can see? Not yet. Um, we're still, um, we have not processed a full waiver. So, and again, we're happy to talk to you offline um, and answer your questions more specifically. Right, okay. One of the slides said that the waiver eligibility is will be available if EV charging stations cannot be provided at a minimal to no cost. Can you elaborate? Is there a threshold amount? We don't have a threshold amount. Um, and so again, that's very specific. Um, and we would want to um, have a follow up conversation, but in the compliance, we're asking you to work with two different EV service providers because you're likely because they all have different business models and you're likely to get a different type of quote um, from a different provider. So hopefully that that'll help um, clarify. The requirement. OK, is an annual permit required per charger or is it per building? Your facility, um, your commercial facility needs an operating permit from the um, San Francisco Police Department and those are annual permits. So somewhere um, in your building operations, you'll have a, a, a due, an expiration date for that permit um, and instructions for and hopefully instructions for how to um, renew that permit every year. So that should be part of your normal operations. Um, and the last question is a garage with no outside parking tenant only required to comply with these requirements. Again, that goes back to your licensing status. Um, so again, um, let's follow up offline and we will capture um, these questions and develop a more robust um, um, fact sheet to go with the to with the compliance materials. And I'll take one last one. Can you give a concrete example of a scenario for a partial waiver? So let's say you need to put in 10 charging stations, but your electrical capacity in the building would allow for four and to upgrade that electrical capacity would be prohibitively expensive. We would likely look at writing a waiver that allows you four chargers as a partial compliance. But again, that waiver has a time limit. Um, so I think we'll wrap up questions um, on compliance at this point. I'll take the last one. Would a tandem parking spot that accommodates two cars count as one parking spot? I think what we're the 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 interpretation that we have is that it's a it's a marked parking spot. If it's a tandem spot or a stacked spot or a valet spot, um, that becomes an operational complexity that seems like a burden. So um, that's what we're looking at is the, the marked spots. And so we'll wrap it up. We'll take any other questions um, and respond to them in our uh, follow up packet, if that's OK. OK, so I'm going to launch into our next section on EV service providers. And in a few minutes, we'll have a panel of speakers representing two EV service, EV charging service providers, and they'll talk about their approach to supplying EV charging. Next slide, please. First, some context. We require garage operators to contact at least two EV service providers because they each provide different services and fee structures to meet your business needs. Some own and operate the equipment, some install the equipment for the owner to manage, and most have strategies to maximize your facility's electrical infrastructure. We are agnostic about EV service providers. We don't make any specific rec recommendations, 
But as mentioned, we will send a follow up packet with information on EV service providers operating in the Bay Area. You can also find information about EV service providers on the Cal EVIP Connects website and the Go Electric Drive website. Next slide, please. Financing and incentives are available for EV charging. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District's CHARGE program opened in December. The CHARGE program provides incentives to reduce the cost of publicly accessible charging stations. Funding is only available for stations that are voluntary and surplus. They can't be used to fulfill legislative mandates. So once we get to January 2023, when the commercial garage ordinance is in effect, charge funds can't be used with these projects. So if you're interested in that program, now's a good time to find out. Proposals are due by March, um, March 1st, 2022, and it is a competitive program this year, which is different from previous years. Another funding source is the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which incentivizes low carbon alternatives to petroleum fuel. LCFS isn't quite a retail program because it requires specific brokering of credits, but EV service providers are well equipped to navigate this process as well as navigating the Air District's charge program. Next slide, please. So now we'll have about 30 minutes for our EV service provider panel. Today we are joined by Jared Carson from ENLX and Jim Roman from Catalyze and Rolf Nygaard from EV Connect, who are co-presenting their combined services. Each presenter will have time to introduce themselves and their company. Then we'll follow with some questions that we've prepared and also your questions submitted via chat. So from left to right, please introduce yourself and take a few minutes to describe your business model and approach to providing charging services from the customer perspective. So take it away, Jared. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great, thanks Suzanne. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, thanks to San Francisco DOE for, for hosting. My name is Jared Carson. I represent NLX, who is a global EV charging station manufacturer and service provider with over 200,000 ports deployed. Uh, specific to North America, we have our own in-house software and level two hardware that's displayed on the bottom of the screen. Uh, and we've integrated our software with a few different DC fast charging hardware providers to provide our, uh, our all-in equipment solutions. Uh, in addition to the equipment itself, we also provide turnkey services helping with project management and design. So that might include, you guys saw the low carbon fuel standard credits uh, explained on the previous slide, that that might include uh, an application into the low carbon fuel standard program and management of those credits as we do have an in-house trading desk with the California Air Resources Board as well. Uh, lastly, where we are providing installation services, we do that through our national subcontractor network. In terms of financing, we have a few options that we can present, uh, which may be relevant to uh, uh, everyone here on this call. You know, firstly, as, as Suzanne overviewed, we can just provide our equipment uh, direct uh, capital expenditure so that the site host owns and operates the equipment, which includes collecting revenue directly from drivers when they use the charging stations. Separately, we can also bring in third party financiers who can, uh, number one, finance the cost of the project, infrastructure, as well as equipment, and then operate those charging stations on the site host behalf. Uh, typically in that scenario where it's no cost, uh, they are increasing foot traffic and perhaps sharing some revenue with the site host in a scenario where we collaborate uh, for any portion of, of the upfront costs. Uh, all these I can go over in more detail, um, either through a specific you know, site walk and, and uh, discussion around your assets. Uh, otherwise, we might have the opportunity here, even on this call, to elaborate a bit more on those options. But just to start, uh, that's the brief overview of NLX and our offerings, and I uh, look forward to having this discussion with you guys. Thanks, Jared. That was great. Um, great. And so 
Um, Jim and Rolf, um, we'll let you decide who's going to go first um, to talk about your services. Thank you. Yeah, this is Jim Roman. I can jump in first. Um, so, you know, Catalyze, we have a joint presentation with EB Connect here. So first I'll talk a little bit about what Catalyze does. So we are a all-inclusive energy services provider specifically targeted towards the commercial and industrial real estate market. Um, you know, we can do anything from solar, wind, battery storage, and EV charging, including some all, or all of those components that I just mentioned. Um, you know, one interesting thing about Catalyze is we just had a strategic acquisition of a company called Microgrid Labs, which is out of Boulder, Colorado, where we are now providing EV fleet services to anyone who requires that. And we can set up an entire microgrid, in fact, as well, so that all the energy that goes to the chargers is fed by the solar, wind, and storage. Um, and, you know, really the crux of Catalyze is that we are a energy company designed for real estate owners. So a lot of the company comes from a real estate background, has transitioned into the energy world, so understands you know, a lot of the pain points that real estate owners go through. Um, and we, you know, we try to smooth out the process when it comes to the energy work. Um, you know, this comes to financing and owning as much of the equipment as possible to reduce the financial burden on site hosts, um, providing upside to site hosts in the form of site leases uh, and revenue share, and really providing that all in turnkey service so that once all of the engineering procurement and construction is done, we finance it, we own it, and make it an easy process for real estate owners. And Rolf, you can jump in now. Rolf, are you on mute, perhaps? No. Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Still getting used to Teams. So um, EV Connect, we've been around since 2009. We are one of the first providers to get into this space. What makes us different is that we're based on open standards. So instead of being locked in to one particular hardware company, we give you the option to choose from over 10 different hardware manufacturers for both um, level two and, and DC chargers. Um, we have a strict certification process. Every charger that we sell has to go through this process. And then um, we're, we believe that our approach makes it much easier for people to future-proof their investments. So at some future point, if you want to uh, change change hardware, or you know, if you want to change vendors, um, there's nothing that's stopping you from doing that. Um, as Jim mentioned, we do provide a full spectrum of, of services of, of, of Turnkey. We'll help you um, choose the right charger based on your needs, and then we'll help manage the entire process as well. And then through our partnership with Catalyze, we think that we offer a very unique solution um, in that. In addition to providing something at, at you know, little to no cost, depending on the site, we could also help site owners avoid any type of demand response charges. And uh, that, in a nutshell, is, is, is what we do. Great. Um, thank you. So again, um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, again, please use the chat to submit questions. We're going to start with uh, some questions that we've queued up and then we'll go to questions in the chat. So um, our first question is, what is your approach to providing charging services from a customer perspective? Where do you start and what information should the customer or site host have available to begin that conversation? And let's start with Jared. 
Great, uh, appreciate the question. So I think you know there's a few different things uh, to evaluate. No, number one would just be from a use case perspective, who is parking at this garage? Are these folks that are coming in for an event and in and out within 30 minutes to an hour? Are they perhaps monthly parkers who are there to go to their office? If that is even such a thing anymore, uh, but maybe when we're out of COVID, folks are going back to the office or even overnight parking for an extended period of time. And I think from the use case perspective, that, that might inform us around whether or not we consider things like DC fast charging solutions or otherwise level two charging solutions. And then to sort of dovetail off of that where we have a good understanding around the use case and who's going to be using the charging stations, what their dwell times are, et cetera. I think the follow up to there is, well, does the infrastructure that's at the site support those charging stations? And where we are considering DC fast charging stations, uh, there are some increased infrastructure requirements from a technical and cost perspective, both. Uh, but all of that then would be part of what we would consider a technical evaluation. So uh, we'd want to look at things like site maps, one line diagrams, uh, understand where the charging stations would ideally be installed, specifically what parking stalls, and then how far away those parking stalls uh, are from things like electrical panels or uh, power feeds that we would tap into to provide electricity to those charging stations. So. Um, I think those would be maybe the two carriers. I'm, I'm curious what what Jim and, and Rolf think of in terms of uh, that or even sort of, sort of some supplemental information, but use case and then charging infrastructure. So or electrical infrastructure, um, pictures, one line diagrams and site maps. Well done, yeah. um, Jim and Jim and Roth. Sure, uh, Jim, I think we both have experience in, in this area, but if you want to go ahead and grab this one. And then I can talk about things on the charger side. Sure. So, you know, a lot of the same requirements that Jared was mentioning, um, it, you know, it really comes down to a good description of the property so that we have an idea of what sort of solution we can design. Um, you know, is it going to be just EV charging? As a site host, are you also interested in canopy solar, a canopy solar system? Uh, do you want storage to avoid demand response issues? Is there an adjacent rooftop where maybe you want solar that feeds the chargers? Um, so the description of the property and the understanding of what the client is looking for really helps us understand how to design an appropriate system and size the right amount of chargers um, that would fit the bill for the site host. Excellent. Um, on the EV Connect side, we'll help you choose the right charger based on your use case. So, for example, if you have office workers who will be parked, you know, for for six, seven, eight hours, um, you could probably get by just fine with with a, with a level two charger. Um, and level two chargers themselves actually have different output levels. So, our advice would be, you know, don't buy more charger than what you need. Um, conversely, if you were located at, at a parking lot that had that had a lot of turnover where people are only parked for, you know, let's say one hour or two hours, then we probably steer you towards either a, a low level DCFC or maybe even perhaps like a, a higher output level two. Um, and then we'll work um, with Catalyze um, again for really a full turnkey solution. Great, thank you. Um, so next question is, how are your charging installations typically financed? What rebates or incentives are available to minimize upfront costs for site hosts in San Francisco? Um, and we'll go in the reverse order. I'll ask um, um, team Jim and Rolf to start and then we'll go to Jared. Um, yeah, so I, Jim, I think we're both pretty fluent in, in this subject. There's, with, with incentives, they typically fall into a couple of different buckets. And usually incentives can be stacked on top of each other. So um, in addition to the Bay Area air quality management incentives, um, many utilities also offer incentives. Recently, PG&E had a program that had pretty significant incentives, not just to cover the cost of the equipment, 
but also they, they would help pay for some of the make ready costs. Um, unfortunately, that program is fully subscribed. Um, from there's probably going to be a new round of incentives from PG&E that will, that will be announced later this year. From the, the federal perspective, you know, we're still kind of waiting to know more about the new funding coming out at the federal level. Um, however, there's still the federal 30C tax credit, which is a uh, 30% or up to $30,000 uh, per location. And again, that can be stacked on top of, you know, any other incentives. Yep, and then as far as beyond those incentives go, um, what Catalyze does is we're called an independent power producer, meaning that it is um, our prerogative to buy and own for the long term any hardware that would go on site to reduce the financial burden that comes onto site hosts. So Catalyze would essentially, you know, if this is in the interest of the site host too, finance all of the equipment up front on our end and you know we do then all the back-end financing uh, whether it comes to sponsor equity uh, tax equity and any project level debt as well jared I'll just piggyback off of that i think uh, both jim and rolf gave a good good explanation and frankly our our uh, options would be fairly similar in terms of you know we can help to evaluate things like the the federal tax credit clearly we're not accountants but we can help at least guide you on its value specific to the project um, and then for available incentives whether it's from the air quality management district or california air resources board the low carbon fuel standard uh, credit in particular uh, we can also support or at least collaborate around the applications into those programs uh, and then help with the management of, of those funds, again, depending on exactly which which program we're referencing. And then um, on the financing side, there there are options, just as Jim overviewed uh, with NLX as well, to have the, uh, the project completely financed, um, and then the stations owned and operated by a third party uh, who would be collecting revenue, and again, potentially sharing that revenue, depending on the exact um, project you know, scope uh, with, with the site host. Great, thank you. I actually learned a few things there. That was great. Um, all right, so our last uh, prepared question is, um, what else would you want a customer or site host to know in advance of an installation? Do you have any tips or suggestions for our audience today? And uh, we'll start with Jared. I, I think firstly, you know, appreciate that everyone's uh, sort of under the gun here with respect to a timeline and, and ordinance and, um, you know, making sure their facilities up to code. Uh, but but I think the, you know, maybe the last thing I, I leave with is this certainly is a revenue generating opportunity for you guys and, and where we can bring in outside capital to finance a project, um, increase foot traffic within the garage um, or even drive electricity resale revenue while helping the site to monetize available incentives. Um, that is all sort of a new revenue generating opportunity for garages that previously didn't exist. And so um, with respect to that, I, I think, you know, that, that's how I'd like to leave it, I guess, personally. Um, there, there's new potential here to generate revenue. Um, and, you know, certainly over the course of the next 10 to 15 years, uh, as we see increased EV adoption and mandates from the state of California, uh, requiring EV sales within the state, uh, more and more folks are going to be looking for places to charge, and that's just greater opportunity um, to monetize your real estate asset uh, for this new you know, stream of EV adoption that we see coming. Great. I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll go ahead, Rolf, and then I'll go after. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as we've kind of talked about before, one thing I think to, to take into consideration is that 2025 will be much different than 2022. Uh, over over the next couple of years, you know, there'll be dozens of new EVs. Um, and market share of EVs will go up dramatically. Um, what's interesting is that um, San Francisco actually has one of the highest rates of EV registrations in the entire country. Um, I think 11% of all car of all car registrations last year 
in the city were were um, pure EVs. So uh, because of that, because you know the city's already off to a fast start, that I think it's it's you know very easy to to see a future where you know 40 percent, 50 percent, etc. will will be you know pure EVs. And then uh, so my advice, I guess, is look ahead to the future. Um, don't think about what you need for the next year, but think about what you need for the next, you know, five to six years. Yeah, and, you know, I think we covered it all right there. The last thing I'd mention is, like with all infrastructure and real estate projects, they take longer than you want them to take. Um, so really, if the best time to start is today or even yesterday. Um, and and we'd be kind of equipped to look at projects and talk to real estate owners and uh, or, you know parking lot managers, whoever it is, and really start to understand what the needs and the use case of a site would be. I'll add real quick that uh, make sure that your EVSC provider is approved by your local utility company, because even if there's not incentives now, there likely will be in the future. But typically, those incentives will only apply if the EVSP that's chosen is approved by that utility company. Great. Um, so we will go to questions in the chat. Um, if we're installing a dual fast charging station, do you recommend installing a CCS1 port and Chatamo port? or two CCS1 ports and why? Do I have a volunteer? I can volunteer for this one. Um, so kind of on the fence, really, I would probably lean towards having two CCSs because Chatamo is going away. It was, um, most of the Chatamo was used by a very limited number of EVs. Uh, for example, the, the Nissan Leaf, and then I think um, some of the earlier Kia EVs had them as well. But really, the entire industry is moving to CCS1. So I, I would probably lean towards CCS1 for, for both of those. Even Nissan itself is actually moving to CCS1. It's a good, uh, that's a good overview that there are some considerations on, on the hardware side with respect to whether or not the DC fast charging station cannot actually operate two ports simultaneously. Um, so that would be another consideration. So let's just make sure that you have that uh, simultaneous charging functionality. Uh, but then with respect to, you know, Chatamo versus CCS1, I think we're all covered it well. Uh, Chatamo's used pretty sparingly uh, and it will ultimately be phased out. Um, CCS1 is, is going to become sort of the North American standard. Um, so I think with respect to those two options, it sounds like CCS1 only is probably the best approach. Great, and I will um, say that um, the re in the requirements for the commercial garage ordinance, we're calling uh, a fast charger anything 40 kilowatts and above. And if it's a dual port fast charging station, it needs to be able to deliver 40 kilowatts to two cars simultaneously, um, just to be clear on that. So, oh, does EV Connect have their own charger to offer? Yeah, so, um we do not. What we found is that the market has really evolved over the last four to five years. So um, originally the market kind of started out with closed standards. So if you had one particular uh, uh, charger, then it would work with one particular um, software. So um, our model is based on open standards. So there's a, a particular standard that, that we follow called OCPP, which is uh, just open charge point protocol. And so any hardware manufacturer that follows that protocol, and most of them do now, we can we have the ability to um, manage and control that station. We, we can see the health of the station, um, if the charges are, are, are available, um, set pricing policy, et cetera, et cetera, all through our software platform that controls any of those hardware manufacturers that meet that same standard. Um, it, you know, like typical to, other companies, we do have our, our preferences is probably, you know, even, we have about 15 different partners total, but, you know, and we have seven or eight that we kind of gravitate to most often. 
Great, thank you. So, <laughs> is hardwiring the chargers more cost effective than installing NEMA 14-50 or NEMA 6-50 outlets? That is way beyond my technical comprehension. Um, do I have a volunteer? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take that and I'm sure folks can, can piggyback off of it. Um, you know, it's hard to offer uh, cost evaluations just just verbally without really diving in technically to the site. Uh, with that said, the, the best answer I can I think I can give you here is is it depends. <laughs> it depends on the scope of the project and how you're thinking about things like future proofing for future demand as an example. So um, do you want to address the immediate need just for the ordinance relative to the number of parking stalls you have? Or are there any considerations to building out a sufficient electrical backbone so that you can add charging stations down the line? And perhaps then in that future proofing scenario and where you're deploying level two charging stations only, uh, this is not relevant for DCFC because everything is going to be hardwired, uh, but maybe in a future proofing scenario, you, you want to consider things like a NEMA outlet um, or maybe in a, a monthly parking garage Maybe you want to consider things like a NEMA outlet just to provide EV drivers with the optionality of bringing their own charging stations. So um, unfortunately, it's not the best answer, but but I think it depends. It depends on the use case and it depends on how you're thinking about um, providing charging to the customers, the, the specific types of clients you're going to receive at your site. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. We would would provide the same type of advice, you know, and really look at future proofing. If you need to make some substantial infrastructure upgrades, it makes a lot of sense just to kind of, you know, look forward to what you're going to need in the year 2030 um, so that you're not just doing it all again at, at some future point. And I would say that the future proofing can be done in a cost effective way. So say you think you'll have X amount of EV chargers by 2025, but X plus one amount by 2030, you can do all this work without buying the chargers by you know, appropriately grading the parking lot, setting up conduit and pull tabs to new locations for additional chargers, so that in the year 2030 or the year 2029, if there's faster adoption, you can then buy a charger and plug it in without having to do all the civil work all over again. Great, so I don't see any more questions in the chat. So I think we'll wrap up this section and say thank you so much um, EV service providers for your time and participation today. That was a really great panel um, and we appreciate your time. So let's go to the next slide and we're gonna try one more poll. Um, are there any areas where you still have questions? Select all that apply. Okay, so it looks like uh, we have a question about compliance, question about rave waivers, um, contacting an EVSP, but some don't have any questions. So again, we invite you to um, follow up with us um, with any, um, any, any remaining questions that you have um, to get started because our goal is to help you get into compliance and not to issue any fines ever. Um, so, Let's go to the next slide. So again, many thanks to our EV service providers for your time and participation today. To wrap up, we recommend that you get started early. There can be long lead times in designing, permitting, and installing charging infrastructure. 
and we recommend that you contact your utility early in the process. So next slide. And in closing, we hope this workshop provided the information you need to get started. The purpose of the ordinance is to increase the availability of public EV charging in San Francisco, not to levy fines or create paperwork. Contacting and talking with EV service providers is your first step, and hopefully you'll be on your way to compliance. If you have questions or come up against obstacles, please reach out to us via chargingmadeeasy at sfgov.org because we're here to help. And I think that's next slide. And with that, um, on behalf of the SF Environment Team and the San Francisco Clean Cities Coalition and our EV service providers, we thank you for attending. Um, this is our final workshop and we will be sending out a recording of the workshop, copy of the slides, EV service provider packet um, within the next week. So thank you for attending and have a great day.